sort of, I don't know, it might have, might have been born even like earlier than what we speculate it, it might have been um, associated with. So like, yeah, you know, there's like medieval uh, music, sort of like this ancient period of time where stuff is relatively unknown, but people do speculate that Indian classical music has actually been around since then, as early as, you know, some of the ancient civilizations that we study in the European world of music. So while you know this was all happening of course it was definitely very contained to the region of south asia so it's interesting how um you know there was so much rich music making happening but it didn't really like kind of get out there until much later so that's one of the first things i wanted to highlight is that indian music is really really tied in with the fact that india is a very very diverse subcontinent um a lot of these traditions, a lot of the musical traditions are tied to, you know, religious practices or cultural practices, languages, things like that. Um, as the country developed, you know, you can kind of see here, there are all these different states. And the states just kind of, to me, are more like countries than states, because in every country you have a unique language spoken by that population for example like you know i'm from tamil nadu which is at the south in the south here um and we speak a language called tamil which is in even in its structure and overall sound is totally different from what they speak here in the west in gujarat or here in the north in kashmir they speak kashmiri in rajasthan they speak hindi in Maharashtra, they speak Marathi. So there are like, they say over like 40 different languages and dialects that kind of represent India as a, as a cultural entity. You know, you have differences in food, you have differences in fashion, um, even just the way people might greet each other or interact with each other is different. It's almost like in, in Europe, you know, it's like a small, gen generally small region, but you, every single country has its own unique voice. Um, so the music kind of reflects that too. I'm talking about classical music today, but there is such uh, an immense folk um, culture. Uh, there's a ton of folk music that's really alive and thriving to this day that's associated with um, a lot of like villages or like tribal culture. Of course, there's Bollywood, which is a lot more kind of a cosmopolitan sound. Um, in a lot of the bigger cities, there are thriving music industries. There's Indian symphonies, Indian jazz, Indian pop. Um, a lot of pop pop music that's consumed is actually from the Bollywood culture as well. So I wish I could I could get into all of it today, but today we're kind of focusing on classical music, which is where it all stemmed from. So. <clears throat> Like I said, it's important to recognize the existence of India's developed classical tradition and distinguish it from folk music. So the difference between classical music and the music you might think of when you think of India um, is that it is actually as developed as a classical performance practice as it is in the Western world. So classical music in India might look a little different. We don't necessarily have like big orchestras and choirs like we do here or like opera, um, but a lot of times a performance setting is, you know, a, a really well-known artist who's performing for a huge audience of people. They're all really silent and they're all listening. And these people are kind of uh, distinguished like celebrities in their own classical way. They spend their whole lives studying this music theory and strengthening their skills. And usually it's, you know, it's kind of like their, their career when it comes to classical music. Um, you can either be a singer or an instrumentalist in this discipline, so we'll get into some of that a little bit later. And classical music in general is usually looked at in two different categories. So we have what's called the Hindustani tradition, which is in the north, and the Carnatic tradition, which is in the south. And like I said, you know, classical music has kind of evolved over time. So it wasn't until the 15th slash kind of 16th centuries that these two um, traditions sort of came to be. And Carnatic music is um, sort of considered like art music or even like art song, you could say. A lot of the text is in Sanskrit, which is a sacred text usually. It describes a lot of Hindu deities in a very poetic way. Um, and Hindustani music is definitely art music as well in its own way, but a lot of times it is um, in a more commonly spoken language. So that could be Hindi, for example. And a lot of the text might be secular. So it could be poetry about love or loss or um, any topic that might have been a little bit more human, I guess. <laughs> so those are kind of 
that's kind of a big difference between the two. Other differences include instrumentation, style, um, and a few other things that I'll talk about here in a sec. So of course, um, while these are two distinct musical traditions, they both have a lot of things that tie them together. Um, you know, I don't, I think if you haven't really spent a lot of time listening to each one significantly, you might not be able to even tell the difference <laughs> because so many elements are common. So um, one of the first things uh, here is thala. And the thing about these elements are that they are pretty much applicable to any music that you might study, right? So we're just gonna kind of learn the Indian terms for these. So thala, everyone say thala. No one's gonna hear you, you're muted. Yeah. The L is kind of like this dark L sound in the back of your mouth, thala. And then the T is like th. So this just refers to any kind of beat or rhythm. So we don't really have separate terms for these, but we do have specific ways of uh, like sort of like the speech rhythm language, as well as um, different ways to kind of keep the beat during a performance. Um, so again, we'll talk about that in a bit. Shruti is kind of an interesting concept. Um, everybody say Shruti. Shruti, yeah. And this refers to something called a tonal center. So a tonal center is basically just, um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it sounds more complicated than it seems. It's basically just where you feel like the home note is in any given piece. So if you're familiar with solfege, you know, we have like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So do is going to be always your tonal center, right? This is an extremely important concept in Indian music. So important that we actually have this entire instrument just dedicated to making sure that the tonal center is always um, sort of vibrant and at the forefront of the music. So this instrument is here on the right and it's called the tanpura. And the tanpura is, it's not a sitar. I know you might think it might be one, but it's not. Some people might be like, oh, it's not a sitar. It looks very similar, but the tanpura is specifically meant to be played upright. So you hold it like this and it, it's sort of like a self accompaniment thing device. So you, you tune each of the four strings to the tonal center as well as the dominant note. So that would be do and so. So it would be like do, so, whichever key you're in. And you just kind of keep playing those notes over and over and over and over again. There's no like beat that you have to follow. You just play them freely. And that sound is like a drone that just keeps going and going and going. And you sing along with it and it kind of keeps you in tune when you sing. And it keeps everybody in your ensemble in tune. And it's such a sort of quintessential part of Indian music. You, you will never hear a concert without it. Sometimes, you know, the soloists, They'll, they'll want to focus on their singing or their playing, right? So they will have one of their students or like their friend or something literally sit in the back and just play that thing the whole time, like that's their job. So um, it's, it's uh, oh, I think- Can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we, it's funny folks, right? We're talking about key signatures and tonal centers and for the past, you know, eight weeks or, or sorry, four weeks Hi. rather. We've been talking about those things. So Vidita, how does, um, you know, if we're talking about, for example, like Eileen says, it's G major. Is there a difference in that tonal center um, that you would say that is fundamental or foundational in um, Indian music? So in Indian music, actually, all um, pitch is just kind of relative. So, um, and I was just about to get into this idea of sargam, which is the next thing. All, any of the, the swaras or the solfege, sargam is basically the Indian word for solfege. We have a different set of syllables, but it's the same idea. Those are all just relative to what key you're in. So no matter what key you're in, your tonal center is your tonal center. So let's say, you know, my range and my, my you know, vocal comfort puts me at, um, you know, wanting to sing in the key of C. So I can, whatever song I'm singing, I can set it to whatever key I want. I would tune my tanpura to play in that key. So I, let's say I wanted to sing in G. I would tune it to play G, which is our tonal center. And then I would also play tune the second string to D, which is the dominant to, to G. So I guess that would sound like this. And it would just kind of be looping over and over and over again, but it sounds way cooler than the keyboard. And I'm gonna play that for you soon. Yeah, that's really cool that you, you know, it's so relevant to what you've been doing already. Um, 
And that's where this idea, again, I said of sadgam comes in. So we'll do a little bit of singing on that later. But the word sadgam or swara just refers to pitch. It can also refer to the solfege syllables, but it basically just means pitch. So if you're saying like, oh, what swaras do I tune the tanpura to? That would be sa and ba, which is the equivalent of do and so. Again, this probably, this might sound like a lot, but I promise it'll make sense by the end of this lecture. Um, so the other uh, really, really crucial concept in Indian music is raga. Um, and this idea is thrown around a lot. And I feel like it's almost kind of misunderstood sometimes. So at its base level, a raga just kind of is a scale. So a major scale, that's a raga. A minor scale, that's a raga. A pentatonic scale, which sounds like this. Sorry, I can't play with my left hand today, apparently. That is also a raga. Um, and um, ragas are also, they can, they can also be um, modes. So I don't know if you guys have talked about modes yet, but modes are kind of different scales with different combinations of half steps and whole steps that create a totally different sound, right? So we have major, minor, you can hear how those are different. But then you have this mode called the Dorian mode, which is kind of minor, but it sounds like this. And then there's another mode called Lydian mode. These, these modes are also kind of associated with European music theory from sort of the like origins of chant during the uh, earlier days of classical music. Um, but the Lydian mode, like I was saying, is a is sort of similar to a major scale, but listen for the fourth tone in this scale. It sounds like this. Here's that four. So the fourth tone is sharp, right? So in Indian music, that, uh, that raga or that mode is called raga yaman. And the Dorian mode, which I played before, that has a name in Indian music too. It's called Karahara Priya. And there are actually infinite ragas similar to this. Unlike in the Western world where we have like a handful of modes and a handful of scales, in Indian music, they kind of take this to the next level by coming up with all kinds of other combinations. So sometimes you can have a raga that's different on the way up and different on the way back down. Or you have to have a certain combination of notes that you have to kind of portray to evoke that raga. And sometimes ragas have like a, a mood association or like seasonal associations, um, rain or sun, heat, uh, particular emotions. Um, there are certain ragas that are meant to be sung in the morning. Some are supposed to be um, spiritually, you know, affected for like healing and things like that. Some ragas are associated with certain Hindu deities and are only used for like devotional musical musical purposes. So there's a lot to unpack when it comes to ragas. There, there could be an entire lecture just on ragas. Um, but I'll kind of stop it at there for now. And I think I touched on languages too. So when it comes to languages, we have a ton of representation of languages in classical music because there are so many languages in India, right? A lot of times you'll hear of Sanskrit, which is kind of like the Indian Latin the root language for a lot of the other uh, languages heard in India. Um, and there's a lot of, again, spiritual association with Sanskrit texts, since a lot of it is associated to the Vedic scriptures of Hindu philosophy and, and such. But again, there's a lot of mu classical music that's sung in Hindi, sung in Bengali, which is another language, Marathi, which is another language, Tamil, which is what I speak. Um, so it's, there, it's, really, it's really quite uh, diverse. Um, so here are some of the ways that Hindustani and Carnatic music are different from each other. So I just talked about the things that kind of tie them together. But there are some ragas, I just talked about ragas, but there are some ragas that are uniquely only Carnatic ragas, and there are some that are only Hindustani ragas. Um, there is also gamaka, which is the word for ornamentation, which sounds fancy, but you all know what ornamentation is. Like if you've ever sung a pop song, you've done ornamentation. Like anytime you scoop or add like a little riff or like any kind of like harmony or extra stuff you do to make your song sound better, that's ornamentation. Um, I think oh, ornament, ornamentation, like the um, people singing the national anthem, right? Is that that's oh. like, it's, you know, if Mariah Carey is singing the national anthem, right? She is ornamenting it. It's not just the, the regular notes on the pitch. She's kind of making stuff up. Exactly, exactly. And that is, I think, 
one of the unique things about Indian music that makes it almost more similar to like pop music than classical music. Because in Western classical music, we have a sheet, we have sheet music, we read exactly what's on the page, right? And if you do something different, your conductor is going to be like, mm, that's not, that's not what it says. Whereas, <laughs> whereas in Indian music, you as a performer have a ton of freedom and you're actually encouraged to make a song your own by ornamenting it a ton. So um, you'll hear that in some of the examples I play here. People improvise like crazy. Um, and the more you kind of learn and the more comfortable and fluent you get in your own musical language, you can ornament even more and create a unique kind of style for yourself. Kind of, kind of similar to jazz too. A lot of comparisons to jazz if anyone's familiar with, with jazz performance practice. So again, languages and text, I talk, talked about this already. A ton of different languages represented here between in between these two genres. Instrumentation is kind of cool. So you might have seen this instrument here on the bottom before. It's called a tabla. So the tabla is a percussion instrument used in the Hindustani music tradition as opposed to the mridangam, which is a bit different. It's a two-headed drum. They both sound kind of similar, but then the, again, stylistically, the way they play it is what kind of makes them different. Um, both of these drums are actually tuned drums. So if anyone's a percussionist or if you've played timpani in a band or something, you know that you have to kind of tune the drums, right? So they match what's going on. So those these Indian drums actually tune to the tanpura, which you see sitting here in the back, sticking up like a giraffe. So whatever key, you know, your tanpura is tuned to, so let's say it's G, the, you would see the tabla or the rhythm player, you know, sitting at the beginning of the concert, like hammering away on the drum, tuning it to that particular note so that it, it is one with the sound. Um, it's a pitched drum and there's also an accompanying instrument usually in a concert setting. In Carnatic music, it is a violin and in Hindustani music, it's a harmonium which I'm not sure if you guys have seen a harmonium or heard of a harmonium, but both of these instruments are um, sort of a product of colonial influence. So India was colonized during the 19th, sort of into the 20th centuries. Um, and it was, there was a lot of influence from British uh, rule, basically, um, culturally and thusly musically. Um, there were, of course, the instruments that were sort of brought in and in, in, introduced, but unlike other colonies, I think India managed to really, really maintain a lot of its, a lot of its heritage. None of that was really, um, you know, suppressed. Rather, it turned into sort of this, like, cultural blooming, blossoming into, like, this something new, I guess. So Indian piece, people basically saw the violin, they were like, hey, that sounds good started playing it with a completely different position. As you can see, the guy has it pointing down and he's playing like this. Or is that a lady? I don't know. It's covered up. Oh, it's a man. Okay. Um, <laughs> and they play it in a style that mimics Indian classical singing. So really ornamented. They even tune it differently. So they tune it um, in, in Western music, violins are tuned in fourths. Wait, fourths or fifths, depending. And um, in Indian music, they're tuned to, again, the home note, which is your tonal center, and the dominant above, exactly. Um, so it was all sort of adapted into making this, this style its own its own unique sound. And the harmonium as well is sort of like a keyboard, and that's like an accordion in the back. That's what gives it the sound. And whoever's playing it is sort of meant to just accompany the singer, accompany the voice, sort of match what they're doing, um, and just give another element, another texture into the sound. Um, last little point here, rhythmic language. I touched on this before a little bit. Rhythmic language is sort of the backbone of percussion playing as well as Indian classical dance, which is also really tied into Indian classical music, right? Because you can't have Indian classical dance if you don't have music to go with it. So a lot of times this rhythmic language I'm referring to is just these neutral syllables. Um, it's sort of like beatboxing. And there's like this whole language of it that you kind of have to study. You study all these syllables and different combinations of them that create different rhythmic passages. So you know how like when you're in third grade, you sing ta ta, ti ti ta to like learn the rhythms? It's kind of like that, but like that on steroids. <laughs> um, like you have um, all these different polyrhythms, which I'll, I'll play an example of it later, which you'll kind of be able to hear. You have syllables like takadimi or terekita ta, takadimi ta. 
and it, it really has like a really cool um, flow to it. And a lot of times vocalists will even sing entire compositions just in this sort of rhythmic language to give it that percussive sound. So in Indian music, a lot of it is less kind of like music in an orchestra where everyone's kind of trying to sound homogenous or in a choral atmosphere where everyone's trying to create this beautiful wall of sound, right? Whereas in Indian music, it's all about those independent textures and them all trying to form this cohesive unit. So that's basically the gist. Um, yeah, I already talked about all this. So here's a little demonstration of Tanpura, which is a sound you might recognize it. You never know where you might have heard this before. Honestly, it's used in a lot of stuff. Um, and it's just listen for how it's droning just the sa and the pa, which are the one and five. And the singer, um, she is a Hindustani singer and she is just freely improvising on a neutral syllable. Um, and she is singing in a raga called John Puri. So this particular raga is kind of based on a minor scale. So a natural minor scale is going to sound like this. Actually, you know what? I don't remember what key this is in. Let me just check really quick. We we haven't covered uh, minor scales yet, folks, but we'll cover no. it next week, actually. Well, you know what? I'm sure you're more familiar than with minor scales than you think, because so much of pop music is in minor, right? Yeah. A lot of like music you hear every day is in minor. So it'll sound, it'll sound, even if it sounds totally crazy, you might be able to hear some, some tones that you recognize. So, ah, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. So, sorry, I don't have perfect pitch. Okay. So she's singing in B flat minor, basically. So her, her home note is B flat. So it's like, and then we've got, so we've got our um, five on top, which is, so you'll hear that droning in the background and she's singing in a minor scale which sounds like la 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 that's that's the outline and she's just improvising within that okay so go ahead and just listen for that if you have any thoughts feel free to drop them in the chat box i sing the khyal form and i also play the tanpura I wish I could play the whole thing. I find it like very meditative and like mesmerizing. And you might've noticed that she also doesn't really go through her entire range. She's really taking her time to kind of lean into every one of those notes, um, really explore uh, you know, her voice in each of those areas, in each of those pitches. And a lot of um, the beauty in this, I think, is the way that each of those pitches sort of melds in with the tanpura so it's very like simple what she's doing kind of you know she's just playing this instrument freely and just singing her own thing but it creates all these like overtones right um so if you if you enjoyed that feel go ahead and uh, maybe i'll send the, this presentation to y'all and you can listen to the whole thing later if you're interested but we have to move on um, so this next clip I really love because it's actually from a Amazon Prime like TV series, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it recently came out. I think it came out like this summer, and it's like a music themed uh, show series that was produced in India, like Amazon India, I guess. And the story follows this this young guy. He's probably like in his twenties, and he is uh, living in India, and he it's set in modern day. So, you know, life is going on as we know it, you know, people are like, you know, getting famous on social media and like pop singers are on TikTok and like, 
um, you know, he has exposure to like all of all of this music, but he chooses to kind of live in his Indian classical music world. It's kind of it's it's not actually very common for younger people to be so heavily immersed in classical music. Um, it is a tradition that's very very alive and well in India, but a lot of times, you know it's less common for people to devote their lives to it entirely. So he's a bit of an oddball. His grandfather's a musician and he studies with him. And here's his, his grandfather having kind of a group lesson with everybody. So this is one of the first scenes in the show. And one of the, the things that they're doing here is improvising on Sargam, which I mentioned before is the Indian set of solfege. So it's the equivalent of our do re mi, but the solfege syllables are sa, re, ga, ma, pa, da, ni. And they are essentially just singing and like battling each other on like who can improvise better. They're having like riff improv battles basically in this scene. It's so funny. Um, these people are not the ones who are actually like uh, singing. They're just actors like lip syncing. So keep that in mind. Um, but they've done a pretty good job. They've done a good job. Um, and whoever the singers are, are like trained professionals. So it's just kind of cool to see, you know, um, in a professional setting or at a high level what this might look like. And you'll notice there's a Tanpura, and then there's a Tabla as well. Yeah, and then he's all smug. He's like, I won the I won the riff battle. Um <laughs> But it's just it's crazy. It's like there's so much expression, I think, that comes from this like ornamentative style of singing. And then again, um, the reason why you might have thought like, oh, those first couple guys, they sounded fine. Why was the teacher being like, no, no? Um, it was because actually uh when you improvise within a framework like this, you know, the percussion is going on behind you in this beat cycle. And it's like a eight or a 16 beat cycle, depending on the piece. So when you take, you know, a couple of cycles to improvise, you have to like, while you're improvising, also be aware of what beat you're on. So that by the time you finish, you land back on that beat one of the next cycle. So it's kind of like a lot of brain work happening all at once. And uh, I guess the first two guys just didn't make it to beat one on time, which is why he was like, shoo, shoo. Um, so anyway, that was just a little look into what a very traditional setting would look like of uh, Hindustani musical practice. Um, this video I love. So this guy, uh, his name is BC Manjunath, and he's a Carnatic percussionist. So he plays the Mridangam, which is that two-sided drum. And what he has started doing, and he's gotten kind of famous for this, is actually notating rhythms for like random things like <laughs> so here it's actually like a sprinkler like in a garden and she'll see and he like notates the rhythms for them and then he speaks them in that rhythmic language that i refer to which is those neutral syllables so ta ta ti ti ta but much crazier right so we'll, we'll just watch this real quick Tak 
It's it goes by so fast, but it's it's so cool to me that like you can you can kind of find a way to uh, speak and internalize these rhythms using the Indian syllables in a way that you might not be able to do otherwise. So, and I love that he added like some lo-fi beats in the back. Like it's like kind of a really good groove there. Um, so speaking of rhythm and speaking of beat, AKA Thala, which is that word I mentioned before, Thala. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of, um, beat keeping here. So, uh, what you'll essentially do to keep the beat during your performance or during practice is you do it with your hand. So it's basically like, you know, your human metronome. Um, so you have to rely on yourself to keep a steady beat and you keep track of wh which beat you're on by using designated hand positions. So beat one is just a clap. So everyone, you can do it with me. It's a clap. Beat two, pinky down. Three, ring finger down. Four, middle finger down. Five, clap again. Six, back of the hand. And then clap again. And then back of the hand. So we've got, let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so this is a South Indian or Carnatic uh, rhythmic practice. So, you know, if you were to have a lesson or if you were to walk into a, a concert, you would you would see everybody kind of doing this, not in their hands, but they would probably do it on their legs. So let's say I were singing something like, let's say I were, I were sing, even singing the previous song. It would be like, so on and so forth. So um, I just, what was I going to do here? Oh, okay. We'll come back to this. I just thought it would be fun to kind of play with it, but we'll re remember this. We'll come back to it. Um, this is another little clip that I love that demonstrates um, sargam, which again, I keep bringing it up, but we're finally, we're finally diving into this idea of sargam. So Sargam is the solfege that I mentioned that is used not just for like singing your scales or doing warm ups and stuff, but actually as like a brain exercise, basically. So there are all kinds of different like sweta or solfege exercises that are practiced in Indian classical music that help you kind of become like fluent in this musical language. So you start associating every single pitch with a particular syllable and eventually, you know, you feel like you can sing anything in, in solfege. So um, these particular exercises are really, really high level. Um, the, this girl was like, was like a prodigy or something like that. And fun fact, she's the same girl who you saw singing earlier as a woman. So this is a video from when she was really, really small. And she's just singing here in a major scale. I'm not sure what it's in, hang on. So it's, it's in B, so it's B major. So you'll hear the thampura, it's B, and then F sharp, Sa, and then this fifth scale degree is Ba, So. She's just gonna kind of go up there. Okay, I wish we could go on because this stuff is really cool to me as well. But she's kind of just doing patterns and singing each of these like solfege patterns, but in like starting on different notes. Um, 
So keeping that in mind, we're going to sing some of this ourselves. We're not going to do anything as crazy as she did. Just really simple. So let's just go over each of these soulfish syllables, right? So we've got sa. You can say them out loud or you can sing them if you want. So we've got sa di ga ma ba da ni sa. Let's do the way back down. Sa ni da ba ma ga di sa. Yeah, might be a little bit of a mind game to do like your Western solfege syllables with like Indian letters. Yeah. Yeah, I have a random question. Do they, do they in Indian um, classical music training, do they also use the, the current hand signs? No. No. No, not so at the, all. The hand signs are only actually... Bulgarian, uh, I think, right? Yeah, that was the Kodai's thing, I believe, right? Yeah, really. So, um, yeah, so the, the hand signs, I mean, I like them because I feel like it gives you a visual of, like, which pitch you're at. Um, so, honestly, I'm all about, like, cultural crossover. Honestly, like... <laughs> Why not? Let's do them both. So um, let's just, oh, okay, this is, we, we know this. So <laughs> this is literally from a, a book that outlines all of the different Swara exercises that you can practice. And it literally has this little section. It's like in European music, it's, this is as follows. And then it like kind of spells everything a little bit weirdly. Um, so this book, I actually have a copy of here. It has this crazy looking cover <laughs> and you can buy it for like five cents in India, the equivalent of like five cents basically maybe not five cents, maybe like a dollar. Um, and it's just full of like all of these exercises that you can practice either on your on voice or on an instrument. Um, and it's kind of like practicing your scales or like practicing your arpeggios or something, but it's for your voice, which honestly, I don't think we do enough of. So um, I really love this tool for kind of like warming up or practicing. So why don't we just do the first one? If you get lost, that's okay. If you sing the wrong vowel on one of these, it's not a big deal your best we're just gonna sing number two here so if you notice it's just um sari 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 gama and then we have a scale going up sari gama padani sa and then same pattern on the way back down sani 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 da pa and then the entire descending scale sani da pa easy enough i think we can handle that all right, so here's your starting note. Ready and go. Sari, 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 gama. Sari, gama. Padani, sa. Sani, 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 da pa. Sani, da pa. Um, all right how'd y'all do i have a doctorate in music and i messed up <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've been doing this since i was seven so i can't i have I, I you know i honestly could not tell you what it would be like if somebody threw this at me and i had no idea what it was so you know i feel like if you even got through it amazing if we want we could try adding another element of to this which is the thala or actually, well, you know, might as well. Let's do it really quick. Let's do it really quick. So let's go over it once. So we have eight beats. So basically one line is gonna be one full cycle. Sa, ri, sa, ri, sa, ri, ga, ma. So that's, that would be one full cycle. Clap, one, two, three. Clap, back, clap, back. So that's about it, okay? All right, same tempo, let's do it again. One, two, ready, and go. Sari, 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 gama, sari, gama, padani, sa, sani, 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 dapa, sani, dapa, ma. Nice. Probably by like the fourth one, you probably got the hang of it, right? <laughs> Very cool. So these exercises start pretty simple and then they get even harder and harder and harder. Um, for example, this one's way more complicated. It sounds like this. 
Sari sa gari gari ma sa ma gari sari ga ma ri gari ma ga ma ga pa ri pa ma ga ri ga ma pa ga ma ga pa ma pa ma da ga da pa ma ga ma pa da. I would keep going, but I think you get the point. And you can do it really fast, like sari sa gari gari ma sa ma gari sari ga ma ri gari ma ga ma ga pa ri pa ma ga ri ga ma pa. And then just you just keep going. Um, you can sing it in any mode or any raga. So I could do this in the Dorian mode I talked about earlier, which is the raga called Karahara Priya. So it goes like this. Um, sa ri ga ma pa da ni sa. And the cool thing about this particular raga is that you probably are more familiar than you think because it's used in so many songs. If you know that song Scarborough Fair, it's like, are you going to Scarborough Fair? Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. So it's like, that's the same mode. There's like Telephone by Lady Gaga. That's in this mode. I think it goes something like, like. Right? Um, there's a ton of like, um, jazz standards that are in this mode there's a lot of folk music in this mode every other pop song is pretty much in this mode like i think like get lucky by daft punk is in this mode <laughs> so if you want to kind of like expose yourself to different modes like that you know you don't, have to, you don't have to limit yourself to major and minor which is one of the things i love about indian music is you actually have a way to practice those things and recognize them for what they are and start identifying them so that this exercise in that mode would be Sari sa gari gari ma sa ma gari sari ga ma ri gari ma ga ma ga pa ri pa ma ga so on and so forth. So it's a really really cool tool. I know we're running out of time here. Um, I had a little video that I thought I would share. Um, I, but I don't know if we have questions. I don't, I want to save time if we have questions. I think actually that we are we can we are welcome to you know if anyone wants to stay on longer or whatnot for to to talk and have more questions but I think we should actually hear this because this is yeah. really really cool I mean this is I um, mean we have two or three minutes left but this is yeah. really neat worth awesome well on the note of the Dorian mode slash this raga that I just played and slash sang for you this choral piece which some of you may have sung um, is also in this particular mode. Um, Il est bon is a choral piece, but it is sort of set from a, a French folk tune. That's why it has that kind of folk sound. Um, and I sang this, I like multi-tracked it for fun this summer, like I said, when I was sitting around not knowing what to do with myself. Um, and I sang it in Sargam to sort of pay some homage to my musical background. So, here it is. Thank <laughs> you. 
Adida, that is so cool. So um, women's chorus, you guys are, remember what song we sang in French last semester? What was it? Directon, right? Um, so Vadita, I'm, I'm correct that you're doing this in Solfege first and then you're singing in the original French. Exactly. This is what, yeah. the 15th, 14th century, 16th century, sorry? Something exactly. Like uh, this is 15th, no, this is 16th. Yeah, yep. really neat. Um, I don't want to cut you off, but um, our class ends at 1150. Right. So I was going to say, um, if people want to stay on, you are welcome to stay on and ask questions and talk more. But I know that some of you guys have to go. So that's totally okay. Thank you so much. Will you do me a huge favor? And because I'm going to put this on the uh, social medias, because why not? If you don't mind just taking uh, taking your camera and turning it on, and I'm going to take a picture and yeah. find yourself on, on the Choral Activities and the Music Department Facebook or and or um, whatever it's called, Instagram, that thing. So... We'll just do that really quick. Wave. There we 